Okay, okay. So welcome everybody. Welcome to our first Friend Friday class from the National Constitution Center. My name is Curry Sautner. I'll be your moderator today and I'll be with you in the chat box if you have any questions to help you out. Today's conversation is all about constitutional conversations and civil dialogue. And we are lucky enough to have Jeff Rosen, our CEO of the Constitution Center, launch this discussion with the Executive Director of the College Board, David Coleman. What a great conversation for civics. What a great conversation for learners of all ages. And we have high school kids and college kids and adults as well as middle school students online today. So this is really a great community for civil dialogue and what our community really is. So without further ado, I am going to officially begin recording because I want to make sure that we have this for posterity's sake. And we are recording, we are live streaming, and we are going to have some civil dialogue. So turning it over to you, Jeff Rosen. Thank you so much, Curry. Welcome, friends. And hi, David. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, Thank you. Friends, I am so looking forward to our conversation with David Coleman. Uh, we are going to talk about why it's important and exciting to study the founding documents and the conversations they inspired. We're going to talk about the value of dissent, and we're going to talk about what we can learn from the ancient Greeks and Romans. And these are all topics that David has thought so deeply about. So let's just plunge right in. David, this is something we both care a whole lot about. Why is it important to study the founding documents and the conversations they inspired? There are a few things in life as a CEO of the College Board, we oversee, for example, the entirety of the AP program, which is 38 different courses and subjects ranging from chemistry and physics to the arts, to the humanities and history and literature, and are responsible as well for, for, the, for the SAT and similar exams. And that can sound like a lot, but there are certain things that if you learn them very well, repay almost everywhere. An example of this would be a core of mathematics, like data analysis, that allows you to do so many things throughout the discipline, such as chemistry and biology, but also in social sciences, giving you enormous power. There are things that if you become masters of them, open up extraordinary possibilities in your life. And I think in the literary field, in the, in the field of the humanities, as law is part of it, the founding documents and the conversation they inspire is a remarkably powerful and efficient mastery to gain. They are few, they are relatively brief in their, in their, in their uh, expression, but if you gain command both of those original documents, but then also get a chance to see how they are talked about throughout the centuries of American history and globally how they are responded to and inspired in part by another global conversation, you become part of a dialogue. So by mastering what is in, in a sense a set of short books, it opens up worlds to you. And that's true throughout the College Board courses. It's also true throughout our nation's civic and cultural life. So beautifully put. And I think that's a really good answer to a very important question the country is having today, which is why do the founders still matter? And of course, we are rightly coming to understand that they were not perfect, that uh, there are some monuments and statues that need to be rethought and that some of the greatest founders themselves uh, were tainted by the original sin of slavery. And yet at the same time, the ideals they embraced were invoked by subsequent heroes, as you say, like Frederick Douglass, like Harriet Tubman, like the he heroes and um, uh, of the abolitionist and women's suffrage movement to ensure that the promise of the founders embodied in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution was extended to subsequent groups and became ever more embracive to use Justice Ginsburg's beautiful word. So David, say a few more words about this topic that we both really care about, especially now and at this contested time, why do the founders still matter? I think what's amazing about this area of study is even if you are the most critical of the founding of this country and feel as some do, that it was founded in slavery and very cruel ideas rather than beautiful ones of liberty for all, which has always been competing narratives about our country's founding. And, and no matter what side of that debate on, if you see some combination, whatever you are, if you're furious at the founders, you must still know them. That is, what is indisputable 
is their remarkable and disproportionate influence on how this nation is now constructed. And if you think parts of that construction are suspicious or cruel, it is your business to know them well, so as best to dismantle them. If you think there are beauties unfulfilled, if you think the unfinished promise of this country is a guide to our future, you must know that promise in its statement. Also, while founders is one word, I think as we look back in history, one thing that makes it dead is the variety and craziness of them is obscured with this regal language of founders. They were nutty individuals uh, with barely control over their personal lives, much less their ideas, which changed and developed. It's quite wonderful to see as remarkable a personality as Ben Franklin come early to the understanding of the cost of slavery. In our, so it's not like there was the founder's position on slavery, as you, of course, so well know, Jeff. This is a diverse, combative, complex group of people. But the most important thing is to study the founders is not to admire them necessarily. We must not conflate those two things. We can also study them and master them to explore the consequences of the limits of their ideas and act upon them. That's so very true. The particularity of history and the variety. And I've just been learning now about the remarkable debate between Thomas Jefferson and Phyllis Wheatley, who was the first African-American poet published in America. She was an enslaved person. She, uh, she took seriously the promise of Jefferson's declaration and starting at the age of 14, wrote incredible poems about virtue, which she derived from the classical sources that she studied and that she and Jefferson believed were the core to the idea of the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson appallingly said that no African-American could write great poetry. And in fact, there was a trial. I just learned this recently, David, to confirm your point about how the fact we're always learning, and it's surprising. The city of Boston held a trial about whether Phyllis Wheatley could have written her own poetry. John Hancock presided, he signed the declaration, and they concluded she had indeed written it because she was a genius, but Jefferson dismissed her and said that uh, it was second rate. And subsequent figures like David Walker invoke Phyllis Wheatley's poetry as an example of the genius of African-Americans and how the promise of the Declaration transcended Jefferson's racism. Uh, it's so exciting it, to learn about that. Story. And it, it's a devastating thing, Jeff, to try to hold in your mind. Is it possible for someone to be good in certain levels, but so cruel and blind in others? These are deep questions about each of us uh, and our own limitations. And, and, and they're profound. I think, though, another aspect of, of, of this study is even if you reject a founder, that does not mean you cannot use your knowledge of the founding to gain power and advocacy in this world. As an example, Barbara Jordan, uh, in an immensely powerful to me rhetorical moment, she is largely forgive me, but as a, as a black woman congresswoman from Texas, she does not command the immediate respect of the colleagues around her, despite her immense intelligence and oratorical power. But a moment comes during the impeachment proceedings where she famously begins, I am an inquisitor. And she begins to give an expert account of the founding documents, especially the Federalist Papers testimony on what impeachment means and does not mean. And to watch the white men around her begin to sit down and realize they have something to learn from this woman. I, whatever your position, uh, it is important to know that the language of power, that understanding it, that having command over it, can not only make you smarter, but make you more powerful as well. Such a great example. That um, vision, it's a film of Barbara Jordan saying, the original constitution did not include me is a central part of the Constitution Center's Freedom Rising show, which inspiringly greets you when you come in and Barbara Jordan like uh, understood the power of knowledge, the power of knowledge alone can empower us so very well. David, uh, speaking of knowledge, you are a scholar of the ancient Greeks. You have written about Aristotle and I have a question about Aristotle because I now understand that the founders from Thomas Jefferson to Phyllis Wheatley look to Aristotle in their definition of the pursuit of happiness. And I understand they did not mean by happiness pursuing our immediate pleasures, feeling good in the short term. Uh, they had in mind something else. Aristotle called it eudaimonia, but I think you can help me define it better than I can. So what did Aristotle mean by eudaimonia? Well, maybe on a personal note, because I've talked, I've said something about knowing a short set of books that gives you a lot of power. I found the Greeks were similar to me. 
the corpus we have, the books we have remaining of ancient Greece are very, are very few, but I found study of them disproportionately illuminating. And um, one reason for that is for the Greeks, spheres that we kept separate are deeply intermingled. Let me give you an example. If you go to Delphi, the temple at Delphi, and notice I say the temple at Delphi, you will find at that exact place, a theater for drama. You'll find right next to it the gymnasium, which meant in that sense a place to run and a place to work out. But imagine how separate our modern society has the world of sports, the world of faith, the world of drama, where for the Greeks, these worlds interpenetrated one another. They were part of a vibrant whole. And to live fully was to participate seamlessly and interactively between these, rather than say the nerd, the jock, and the priest, just separate concepts. Um, and so what, what I, that's what drew me to the Greeks. And I think, I think there are probably possibilities that in African history and in different cultures, the Confucius legacy in China, there are often cases where a relatively short book, a relatively powerful cornerstone text or set of texts can open up a conversation that's very broad. But to answer your question quite specifically, in a kind of fun way, Aristotle writes a book about what it is to live a good or happy life. He calls it the Nicomachean Ethics. And the key word is, as you said, eudaimonia. And uh, there, that's made of two words, you, which means good, like utopia, a good place, or uh, euphoria, a good feeling. So that's what you means. And daimon, which is the more surprising part of it, like demon, is to have a good spirit over you. So precisely what the word means is to be ruled over by a good spirit. I say this because for the Greeks to be happy included ideas of luck, included ideas of good fortune. Uh, there's a humility in that. That is, as you would no doubt note, Jeff, you're a great attendant to words. The constitution says the pursuit of happiness, but no one on this earth can promise happiness itself, but we can try to make its pursuit possible. So the Greeks recognized that eudaimonia was a blessed state. But happiness for Aristotle, I think, is best translated, if you had one English word, I would choose flourishing, mm -hmm. which is a pleasure in the full realization of your life. It is pleasure. It is delight. It is felt now. It is a kind of pleasure from intense conversation, from food well made, from doing the right thing and feeling good about it while you do it. It is the pleasure of an athlete in working at the height of his or her field and showing their skill. It's the hard-won pleasure of devoting yourself to activities you love and gradually becoming better at them. That's kind of what eudaimonia looks like. Beautiful. Friends, did you hear that inspiring definition? The pleasure of devoting yourself to a, a calling that you love and slowly becoming better at it. And that crucial idea of self-mastery, self-governance was so crucial uh, for Aristotle uh, uh, of course, and then for subsequent Greek and Roman philosophers like the Stoics and the Epicureans who influenced the founders, and for the Enlightenment thinkers who influenced the founders. And there's a central idea of mastering our unreasonable passions with our reason. Aristotle talked about our duty to connect to the reason that unites all things in the universe. And he said we could only do that by mastering unreasonable passions like anger, jealousy, and fear. Just before the class started, uh, we were talking about the four classical virtues of temperance, prudence, courage, and justice. They come from uh, Plato, Aristotle uh, glossed them in the, in the Nicomachean Ethics, but all of those to achieve temperance, prudence, courage, and justice, we have to master our ego-based impulses like anger or uh, jealousy and fear. David, what I want to ask you next is the connection between those personal forms of self-governance, mastering reason with passion, with the political or democratic virtues of mastering passion with reason. The American framers thought that only if we slow down deliberation, if we don't make laws based on our immediate impulses, but instead listen to our fellow citizens uh, thoughtfully, can we be guided as a country and a constitution by reason rather than passion? So what can Athenian and Roman democratic thinking have to teach us in America today? Well, I'll tell you something funny, Jeff. Uh, just like the founders are very different people and should not be lumped together, so too the Greeks. 
So actually, you sounded a lot more like Plato than Aristotle, if you don't mind. The notion of reason governing the unruly passions is much more from him. Aristotle, I think, has a slightly more daring idea. He argues that reason, that our ability to think should change our pleasures, not govern them. So temperance, to be clear in Aristotle, is not only really the virtue of not eating too much, not doing too much of something. It is also taking deep pleasure in food by not doing it to excess, but also finding the specific pleasures within it. It's finding great pleasure in pleasure. Aristotle distinguishes the temperate person from the person who can't feel and can't touch and experience those pleasures. So for Aristotle, Interestingly, he's interested in the full realization of pleasure. It's, a very, uh, it's very warm to the notion of living a happy life. To give you another example of anger, he actually thinks anger expresses judgment and reason. And what's critical in understanding your anger is to understand the why of your anger, to understand that it's not just an emotion, but it's a judgment. And so in other words, you should use anger as a source of insight, never action, but you should understand the reason it expresses. So for Aristotle, you can't just say there's the mind separated from anger. It rather is a notion that we must unify our ability to think and feel and infuse our feelings and be thoughtful about how thought and emotion blend together, uh, I think is his great contribution to this conversation and different than the Plato picture of reason ruling the desires uh, where they seem separate things. And I only did all that because that has helped me live my life. When I became a CEO and began supervising people, as all of you may do, whether you're working in student groups or as you grow up in this life, I found anger one of the great threats to my goodness and happiness as a human being. I get mad. I, you know, you're mad, you're disappointed in other people, you're under pressure. And I went back to Aristotle to think about how could I acknowledge my anger as having a foundation, but not let it rule me. Hmm. Uh, and just holding it down was not a good answer for me. I had to instead study it, understand what was behind it, and then choose not to act on it. So forgive me for that, but I'm trying to say that these forms of study, when Jeff and I tell you to spend a lot of time reading or to really pay attention when you're reading, to read with love and devotion, the more love and devotion you read with, the more it helps you at hard moments in your life, at moments of decision or moments that are fateful for you. And for myself as a leader and as a man in my marriage with my husband and with my children, I find self, the self-conquering of anger one of the great challenges of life. Yes. Um, and I know that may sound strange in this context, but I, I got a little more personal. You then asked about the Athenians and kind of what is the private happiness that I'm describing have to do with public well-being and the, and the, and the, and the well-being of the state. And um, I have a riddle for you. Uh, Jeff, as a way of putting this to you, what do you think is the reason that Athens is both the birthplace of drama, which I know you're a fan of, at yeah. least in your private life, including musical theater. I hope I don't embarrass you with this. Uh -huh. And uh, that you're a fan of drama, but also democracy. Yes. Why, yeah. why did one place seem to give rise to both? I don't know the answer, but did they both meet in public in the, in the Agora, in, in theaters? Or the yeah, could be, right? So one thing is they're both outside. Yeah. You're quite right, but so is a lot. So is the gymnasium. Yeah. Everything's outside. The agora means the, the area we gather. And uh, so, so that wouldn't quite distinguish them. I did not have any idea as to the answer to my own question until I saw a brilliant man who is the director of, um, of uh, the art program at the public theater, the Joseph Papp Public Theater, spoke mm -hmm. about this. He's the one who helped Hamilton become Hamilton. So everything aligns, right? So he's the one who helped Hamilton come alive um, and a great friend and artistic collaborator with Lin-Manuel Miranda. What he said is this, before drama really began in Greece, it was just speeches, one person on stage speaking. Drama began in Greece when you began to have, instead of one person on stage, two or three or other characters, which meant there was no single authority but a debate. You went from a single ruler to a conversation and the demos and the democracy. So the democracy on stage and the democracy in the public sphere. Wow, that's fascinating. And how did the Greeks come from that understanding to the fear that large assemblies 
um, as Madison said, in any large assembly of any number composed, passion never fails to wrest the scepter from reason. Even if every Athenian had been Socrates, Athens would still have been a mob. The framers take from the example of Athenian democracy, the danger of unregulated discussion among large groups, and they wanna temper that with representative democracy to slow down deliberation and avoid mob rule. What was, how for them was, were Athens and uh, Rome a negative example? If you ever wonder whether old thinkers are relevant to current life, I would point you towards Plato's ability to see the future. Of the great Greek minds, Plato, everything we have about Socrates who was killed by the Athenians comes from Plato. And it's Plato who in the Apology and other writings about Socrates shows the viciousness of the Athenian state. And Athens, and excuse me, so, uh, Aristotle will later flee Athens, lest Athens sin twice against philosophy in fear for himself. So again, when we talk about Athens as the foundation of the Western world, it's so ridiculous. It was, it was a place where these ideals were in great danger even then. That's a great mistake to make that we reify Greece. No, Athens was combative and often prone to tyrannical episodes and often threatening to the very philosophy that was brought to birth there. So it reminds us of ourselves with all our hunks and colors and failures. And Plato, to me, Aristotle is a beautiful mind to describe the world. Plato is the greatest mind of how it can go wrong, of the forces of corruption. There's an absolutely terrifying portion in Plato's Republic, his great text, where he describes how the young philosopher king gets corrupted. He describes why someone with so much promise becomes a tyrant rather than a beneficial ruler. And he describes how this person realizes suddenly that they can speak words that draw upon the darkest parts of their listeners. The, the, this bright young person can sense the hatreds and cruelties inside of people. And by saying them out loud, they get a sudden rush of power and excitement. And in a, one of the most fateful moments of my young life, I happened to have next to me a diary of Hitler when he gave an early speech in a beer hall. And he said, I said increasingly cruel and outlandish things and got more and more applause. And it was so similar as to Plato saw it all coming. He saw the danger that there are within us and we must not avoid this immense desires for cruelty and hurting one another. And, and, and that sometimes someone who says them at first looks strange, at first looks far beyond what we think is public dialogue and says shockingly cruel things and gets immense resonance. So Plato saw a very great danger that big ideas like oratory and engaging the public mind and art could in the wrong hands be tools of remarkable cruelty. What a powerful example. And the framers were so haunted by those stories that, frame, that Plato foretold that Madison had uh, a trunk full of books that Jefferson had sent from Paris about the failure of ancient democracies. And of course, they were applying that to the dramas in their own time, in particular, Shays' Rebellion, where debtors in Massachusetts were rising up against their creditors and the whole constitution was formed to create a government strong enough to avoid that kind of mob-based unrest, but restrained enough to protect liberty. If you had to tell a story of the founding from our, uh, that would inspire our friends to learn more, um, Shays' Rebellion is one story, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, complicated one, what, 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 what story uh, from the founding or from Reconstruction or, uh, would you tell to, to, to inspire our friends to learn more about the Constitution and American history? I would ask them to look at the building behind you, but not be misled by it. We show the Constitution, the founders, and these grand big buildings, the Lincoln Memorial. They look immovable. The building behind you looks enduring. But I want to emphasize its fragility. The birthplace of democracy lost democracy and Athens succumbed to tyranny. These documents were never designed by the founders as an insurance policy or stay. They tried their best to make them somewhat resistant to the cruelties we are possible of, but they are not walls, they're just guides. They're just an attempt to begin to mute those forces, but it requires all of us 
to be remarkably vigilant and active. If we learn anything from one another, if we think a constitution is enough to stop the cruelties of racism at their most savage, it is enough to prevent inequality, is it enough to prevent us from harming one another each and every day or submitting each other to pain, we're sadly mistaken. If we think the Constitution and its wonderful design guarantees and safeguards our democracy like a magic spirit absent our daily activity, Aristotle says beautifully that virtue and excellence are extremely rare and everything to either side of them is danger. So I think the reason for the renewed study of these documents is not to merely hallow them and admire them, but to witness at the same time their limitations and their reliance on us to do all we can as vigorously as possible to refresh the tree of liberty. That's beautifully said. Uh, and it's so important to emphasize virtue is rare and we have to work at it. And you've been sharing some very personal ways that these classical sources have affected your life. And I can share too that I, I discovered them recently because I knew the founders had read the classics, but I had not read them myself, although I had the great blessing of an incredible education. And I find myself both so humbled by all there is to learn and also so struck by how it's a daily challenge. David, you put it so well, overcoming our anger, jealousy, and fear is difficult. It requires exactly. attentiveness and mindfulness every hour of every day. And you and I, are much further along in our careers than our friends who are, who are just uh, starting off. But it's a, it's a task that never stops and it involves self-mastery. It involves deep reading because you're always learning and growing and re-examining your ideas. And it involves conversation. And the reason I'm so grateful for our friendship and for the fact that we're able to share our conversation with our friends today is that I always learn from you. You've taught me so much about the difference between Aristotle and Plato. They're different conceptions of virtue, the different implications for the founding, and the need to be always alert. So the ability both to read deeply on your own and to talk to others, that, con that conversation is the definition of meaningful friendship and is also core to democratic dialogue as well. We, we need to wrap up uh, soon because we, we, wa uh, we want to keep things tight, but I, I guess I'll, I, I want your closing thoughts, but I, I, among them, I'd love you to give us all some, some book recommendations for more reading. You've t you, you talked about Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Maybe you tell us which books of Plato have moved you and maybe give us a couple other uh, things that we can read and grow from. If you don't mind, I'm gonna make a shameless plug. And that is to begin with the constitution itself and the amendments that are part of it. And in particular, I would advise you to read closely the amendments and the interactive constitution that expresses how those very, because they're very short. I, I, one danger of the way Jeff and I have talked is we've talked about a lifetime of reading, but I want to give you a place to begin. And that is with the very constitution of, this, of the United States, because the amendments are really short. You can take them in in a, in a few minutes, in a few hours, but then to look at the interactive constitution freely given by the National Constitution Center and see that how that same notion of the First Amendment plays internationally, how it developed over time, you begin to feel the force of each and every word. So rather than feeling that to have a profound experience, you need to read a whole tier of demanding books, I'd actually ask, ask you to shove aside a set of books for a minute and pull out a couple of sheets of paper that have, that have the, the Bill of Rights on them, or you know, it could be one probably. And then to begin to look more deeply, one at a time, think about how they interact. Think about even how within the First Amendment, it is not, it is at once the freedom to the free expression of religion and ideas. And how can those go together? Are there tensions between them and the freedom of the press? How do all of these five things that it cites exist at once? Slow down, take it word by word, learning the power of each word in those amendments and gradually the constitution itself opens up worlds alone. My next short book for you, if you're interested in what Jeff and I have talked about is Plato's Apology. It is the story of Socrates defense of himself at the trial after which he's found guilty and put to death. But it is a focused open expression of some of the things the Greeks cared about. So beautiful. Uh, thank you for the recommendation of the apology. Thank you for, and now I'll just screen share to show the plug, the constitution itself, the interactive constitution, start exploring what a wonderful invitation to the text, which David has called us to. And we can pick any amendment, the 
First, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Friends, those are five freedoms. We could, we could spend a lifetime parsing each clause. And in this class together, we will spend um, our semester in the fall and the spring parsing each of the amendments and the structural constitution. And David is so right, begin with the text and then dig deep, dig into the history, the stories that inspired the text, the Supreme Court cases that interpreted them, the philosophical principles that gave meaning to them. It's just a thrilling lifetime of learning, all of which we begin with the words. And one thing David and I share is that we uh, are, love literature and, and love uh, the humanities. And we believe that learning about the constitution will inspire you to pay close attention to words and the, the placement of single words can shape the destiny of nations. So this kind of close reading and this kind of inspiration of the learning of the past and its application to the present is something, it's, it's a gift that we were given by our great teachers and that we're hoping to share with you. And that's what the point of these classes are. And that's why Curry and I and Tom and Nick and our Constitution Center colleagues are just three times a week, we're just going online because we wanna excite you about learning and inspire you to learn about the Constitution. David, I'm so grateful to you for teaching me and our friends about the Greeks, about the philosophical principles of the Constitution, and about the importance of words. Thank you for all you do at the College Board, and here's to a lifetime of learning together. Thank, Thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks for your friendship. Your friends. Take we'll care. See you, see you next week. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. As always a really fun class um, and don't worry I know we listed a, gr a bunch of great readings during that class we will send you an email with all the readings that you can dive into uh, over the course of the year as well as the recording as well as all the classes you can sign up for again you can join us weekly to have these discussions and go from the practical realities of how we see the constitution every day to the founding documents to ancient Greece and Rome we span the entire world. I think the big idea that we're walking away with today that is so, so important as we look to history to learn all of the history, the whole history, and understanding the past with its beauty and imperfections. So I want to thank Jeff so much. I want to thank David Coleman. Jeff, as we pause and kind of wrap up, do you want to do a real quick Q&A with a few questions in the, in the uh, Q&A box? Of course. Awesome, okay. So number one, Victoria's question from earlier, she wants to start her children young. I love this question. So what would you suggest for a two-year-old? What would be some of the things that you could do for a two-year-old to get them excited about the solid foundation in democracy? Um, you know, I believe two-year-olds actually probably understand democracy and republics better than most adults. <laughs> but I, you know, I worked with uh, kindergarten kids, so I've seen them in action. But you, can you think of any great books to read or to them on this topic? I think that telling stories about history is the way to get excited and to, uh, there, there are wonderful books about founding stories for all ages and just start telling the stories of heroes like uh, Benjamin Franklin and Frederick Douglass and uh, George Washington and, and then uh, take it from there. But, but I really believe you could tell from the conversation with David, it's really just the love of reading and, and learning and, and attention to words. So literature is just wonderful for kids too. And, and starting with, uh, 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 fairy tales and and and, and uh, great uh, myths and stories. The Greek myths are superb for engaging kids. Just getting uh, from a very young age, um, becoming lovers of of reading, which means a lot of reading out loud. So that's the most important thing you can do is just read as much as possible, and then literature and history, and then politics later on. John Adams said something really striking. He was, of course, so learned in all the classics and was a founder and was president, but he said, I study history and the constitution so that uh, my sons can study poetry and literature. So he thought, in fact, it was the, almost the greater gift to have the leisure uh, ability to study literature, but he had to establish the foundations to make that possible. 
And I, as you know, teaching uh, small children reading, I totally echo that. So reading out loud, we all know is huge, but those classic children's books, you can always find a civics theme. So when you're looking at, you know, the idea of um, the three little pigs and the, the big bad wolf. And I, you know, everybody loves that story. Think about it from different perspectives. Uh, what's the, the wolf's perspective? What is the perspective of the building? What, what are the other pieces? So think about all these stories, all these classic pieces, and then kind of build the whole story around it. And your children are so creative. So give them the, the latitude to think differently and from different perspectives. And that brings you into a community and conversation around civics. Another great question was, um, is Aristotle offering a particular way to achieve these goals or is he setting the goal and having us discover how to reach it ourselves? That was from Kerry Willis. So I wanted to share that one. Good one, right? <laughs> great, great one. So of course, David uh, knows far more about Aristotle than I do, but I do know that the Nicomachean Ethics has a chart of um, which counsels us to take the middle way. One of Aristotle's big ideas is there's always a virtue that has an excess and a defect. Um, and I can't do them from memory, but temperance would be the middle way and the excess might be uh, excessive uh, zeal and the defect would be indifference. And he has a whole bunch of these. So generally his counsel is to avoid extremes, to master our uh, passions enough to be able to be moderate. And that central idea of the golden mean, as Pythagoras puts it, is so central to Greek and Roman thought. And far from being some kind of boring, you know, plain vanilla uh, kumbaya kind of standard, it's really difficult to achieve as we were talking about it. It takes daily attention to master our passions and, and avoid either too much or too little, just right, you know, in the Goldilocks way. But that's Aristotle's counsel. And in the Nicomachean Ethics, you'll see the whole list of the middle uh, virtue and each of its extremes. Okay, one more question real quick, because I love it too much. And then we'll end, I promise. <laughs> um, so um, Lois asked, does the way democracy developed in cities like Athens with all of its gatherings um, out in public places, does it preclude a country this size, this size from being able to, to maintain this type of democracy? It's a great classic question. I love it. Thank you for asking it. Jeff, I figured it's a good ending question for you too. <laughs> well, it is a great question because it was the central question that the founders were worried about when they came to Philadelphia. Classic political theory had said you could only have a democracy in a small state because you had, people had to know each other in order to deliberate face to face. The Athenian model is 6,000 people in the Agora deliberating together. The problem with that is Madison fears that people could be misled by silver tongued demagogues who would lead them to be governed by passion rather than reason and start the Peloponnesian War. So Madison came up with a brilliant solution, representation. If you have people represented in deliberative bodies, then you, can, you don't have to bring everyone face to face. But then Madison had a second brilliant insight. This could happen in a large republic. In fact, it would be even better, Madison said, to have a big republic like the United States rather than a small one because in a really big territory, passionate factions or mobs couldn't discover each other. And by the time they did, they would either get tired and go home or they would calm down. So these two brilliant innovations, Madison thought, representative democracy in a large or extended republic would ensure that the dangers of faction would be avoided. Now, here's a discussion for future classes. <laughs> Madison did not anticipate Twitter and Facebook. And in a world of social media, where factions or really enthusiastic groups can discover each other immediately and start making really hasty decisions and can uh, do their uh, passionate uh, business uh, before they have time for second thoughts, many of the, of the virtues of the extended republic are obviated and the fact that it'd be really hard to organize all goes away. So here's some uh, uh, really important follow-up question for all of us to talk about throughout the term. Was Madison too optimistic that the large size of America would allow passions to cool and reason to prevail. And it's a great wrap up. I have one thing to add from Jacqueline because I thought it was the best statement so far this week. Um, but before we wrap up, remember everybody, these programs are live every single week. We also send them to YouTube. So if you can't come through the Zoom, come through the YouTube and we keep them posted every week because we know schools and classes are using them in lots of different ways. 
Monday and Wednesday sessions are for middle school and high school. Friday is our all in session, which I love to mix the age groups. So here's Jacqueline's closing thoughts. Jacqueline stated, I came for the dialogue. I stayed for the emotional regulation. Who knew? But thank ah, you. <laughs> bravo. I know. Bravo, Jacqueline. Thank you so much, everybody. We will see you next week when we dive deeply into the ideas around popular sovereignty, rule of law, and not my favorite, my favorite natural rights. So we'll see you next week. Everybody have a great uh, weekend as well. Great Labor Day weekend. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.